Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, let's have a few moments of silent prayer, and that will give you the opportunity to make sure you're in fellowship and ready to study the Word, and then I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're so very grateful for this opportunity that we have to study your word, to be refreshed, to come to a greater and clearer understanding of what you have revealed to us in your word. Father, we're thankful for the way things went yesterday with our first uh, Good News Club. We pray that uh, as we continue, we can get uh, a little uh, better in our organization performance. But we'll have opportunities for a one-on-one op- uh, option to uh, communicate to the kids Make sure they, they understand the gospel and that they're saved. And Father, we pray for us that we might continue to be uh, faithful in prayer for this event and that we might continue to seek opportunities and ways uh, to serve you. Father, we continue to pray for our nation. We continue to pray for our leaders. We pray that you would uh, continue to foil uh, plans and, and uh, programs that are ultimately detrimental uh, to this nation, we pray for godly leaders who understand truth, understand principle, and are willing to take a stand for it no matter what the opposition, and that you might uh, prevent those from doing things that would bring harm to this country, and that you might elevate men who have wisdom and men who are constitutionalists and men who understand uh, what needs to be done and can get things done to reverse course in this country. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. We're in Romans chapter 11, and tonight we're going to get into one of the great uh, metaphors, one of the great illustrations in Scripture that relates to God's plan and purpose for Israel and the relationship between Israel and the church. Actually, there's two metaphors for this. One is more known than the other. Uh, The one is the metaphor related to the lump of dough, which relates back to a first fruit offering. And then the second is the olive tree, the domesticated olive tree that has branches that are removed and then wild branches from a wild olive tree grafted in. And so we'll look at that. And it's really important when you go through this passage to pay attention to some of the details. And I, uh, <clears throat> ever since we started the Bible study methods class on Sunday night, I've been pointing out little things uh, that we cover in the Bible study methods class just uh, for those who are who are uh, taking that course. But this is one of the, a, a classic example tonight of the importance of looking at uh, some of the details, looking especially at pronouns and the antecedents to pronouns. For those of you who don't talk grammar, an antecedent is that word to which a pronoun uh, looks back and, uh, and is directed to. And a lot of times you read a verse and you see the he's and the she's and the they's and the theirs and the we's, and you think you know who it's describing, but sometimes it's really important to nail that down because it helps clarify uh, tremendously the uh, significance of the passage. So we're going to start off just by way of review, and instead of looking at Romans 10, 9 and 10 as well, which you've heard so many times, you probably uh, have that <clears throat> drilled into you, I just want to focus on our understanding of Romans 11. It answers the initial question, has God cast away his people? And the implication from this, the way the question is asked uh, implies the negative answer, but it's an extremely strong uh, answer. Paul is, puts everything behind it that absolutely not, God still has a plan for his people. 
Now, the thing that we have to continue to remember, this doesn't always fit with how we sometimes think about things, is that Paul is dealing with God's plan for Israel as a corporate entity. When God called Abraham, he, he called Abraham out of early Chaldees, brought Abraham to a new land, and said that it would be through his descendants, his seed, that's that corporate entity, that God would bless the whole world. God would bless the Gentiles through the seed, through the descendants, through that corporate entity uh, of Israel. And that's important to understand. That doesn't mean that every single Jew is going to be uh, a blessing to the Gentiles. But it means that in terms of their corporate destiny, their, their, the role of Israel within the plan of God, they would provide blessing to the rest of humanity. Of course, we know this primarily through because it is through Israel that the Messiah would come. It's through Israel that the scriptures uh, were revealed and preserved and passed down through, through the centuries. Uh, but this was their corporate destiny. That's what we're talking about in Romans 9. It's not the individual, plan, God's plan for every individual Israelite, every individual Jew, but for Israel as a corporate entity. And when we see that term Israel, we're also going to see it juxtaposed to Gentile. And in the same way, it's not talking about God's plan, not even God's plan of salvation for each and every Gentile, but for God's plan for Gentiles as a corporate entity and Jews as a corporate entity. And the focus in this chapter, as we I continue to point out, is not on individual justification or individual salvation. In fact, what's interesting is as we study in theology and we study in, in uh, different groups of, of in, interpreters of Scripture, what you will discover is that those who are of a uh, consistent Reformed background, and by that I mean they hold to covenant theology, they're amillennial for most part, postmillennial for some others, but within that, within that group, they almost to a man will interpret this passage in terms of individuals and in terms of salvation. So if you're a dispensationalist, if you're premillennial, uh, then, then it, you don't interpret it a certain way because you're premillennial or because you're dispensational, but because you're, we're consistently applying the principles of literal, grammatical, historical interpretation to the passage, we come out recognizing that this is not talking about individuals, it's talking about that corporate entity. And we saw that going all the way back to Romans 9, when Paul first uh, introduced this topic of God's plan for Israel, and there he talked about God's choice, his historical selection of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that it would be through Jacob and not through Esau that God's plan would be accomplished. That's important because in that passage we, brought, we were first introduced to this concept of election and selection by God, but when most people see that, or a lot of people see that, they immediately think about individual personal salvation or individual justification. And as I pointed out then and have reviewed it many times, that's not the context. The context is God was selecting the, the, the group, the genetic group, through whom he would work his planet. What, he wasn't selecting Esau for salvation, or excuse me, Jacob, or uh, Israel for justification and Esau for for uh, condemnation. He was talking about them in terms of the descendants that they represented, looking at them as nations, as it's clearly indicated uh, back in Genesis. So we get back into this issue. Uh, last week we talked about the important doctrine of the remnant, as it's illustrated with with Elijah in verses three and four, uh, and then. Um, and we looked at the concept of remnant as it plays this r important role within uh, Romans, Romans 11. And remnant is important to understand because there's two groups within the total body uh, of Israel. And that there is a non-technical use of remnant, which just refers to survivors or those who remain after something. And then there was a technical use of the word we saw where the word remnant described uh, positive believers within uh, within the group and within within Israel. 
And so I put this diagram up that you have a uh, the corporate entity of Israel as a whole, most of whom throughout history have rejected God. This was true in the Old Testament time and time and time again. This was the message of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Hosea, uh, challenging and condemning the nation because they have uh, gone after the false gods and idols rather than following God and worshiping him and obeying Torah. There were times in Israel's history when when a majority were positive, but those were limited to just five or six different key periods in history. So within this overall group of Israel, there's one group that is true Israel, and that is the remnant described uh, here in verse 5. At the time of Elijah, it was Elijah who was in the northern kingdom plus the 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal. And so we worked through the passage. We talked about how this illustrated grace and uh, Romans 11.6. We reviewed the doctrine of grace last time that grace excludes works. Now, works is not a term that simply means that we do something. Obviously, in some broad sense of the word, we perform some act when we get saved. We believe. We do something. We, move, we, we change our mind. We make a volitional decision. That's an act. But that is not what we mean by doing works. There's no merit to that. When we get into the scriptures in verses like this, it's obviously... Uh, it's obvious that works refers to that which people think brings them merit or approval before God. But this is completely excluded. There's nothing that we do that merits, that, that, that we can do to earn salvation. It is not of works at all. It is of grace. Grace is a free gift that completely excludes any basis of merit on the part of the recipient of grace. Now, where that's important is in a lot of Reformed or Calvinistic theology, faith is viewed as meritorious. And in the, those who believe that also believe that God gives faith to the elect, gives saving faith to the elect. They believe there's a categorical, qualitative difference between the kind of faith that saves and the kind of faith that doesn't. We don't believe that's right. We believe that faith is faith, and faith is non-meritorious, that faith is sort of like a tube. We're saved by grace through faith, and what's at the other end of that tube through which the grace and the faith goes is, is what has merit, and what's at the other end of that tube is Jesus Christ on the cross. And so when we uh, put our faith alone in Christ alone, then we are saved on the basis of his work in his righteousness, not on the basis of our works or our righteousness, and not even faith has some merit, not even our decision has, has merit. And so this verse 6 is one of those key verses that, uh, that juxtaposes grace and works and makes it clear that works has no place whatsoever in earning or meriting salvation. Now we come to verse 7. Verse 7 again introduces a rhetorical question as Paul tries to guide our thinking through this issue of what is uh, God's plan for Israel. He says, what then? Okay, if this is true, if, um, if it's all based upon grace, it's not based on any merit on our part, then... Um, what impact does that have on understanding God's plan for Israel? And so he goes to the next point, which is, Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now this brings up another important issue, and that is, uh, again, the issue of election. Now I've already reviewed us on this doctrine as it is contextually, that the selection here of the elect is not a selection for salvation, for individual salvation, but has to do with a selection for God's plan and purposes within history. And so the first term that we look at in here that's important is the term Israel. And Israel refers to corporate ethnic Israel, that is, all of those who were descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Paul says, as a whole, 
they have not obtained what they seek. Now, what is it that they're seeking? That's an important question here. It's it, 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 a lot of this is going to telescope down to the il- understanding the illustrations of the lump and the of the lump of dough and the uh, olive tree. And you'll hear a lot of people who try to use that to refer to salvation, and it doesn't refer to salvation. I'll go into that a little bit when we get there. Both of them refer to being in a place uh, uh, of blessing. The olive tree as we'll see, is composed of the root and the branches. The root is the Abrahamic covenant. It's The olive tree does not relate to being in a place of salvation. How do we know that? Well, because some of the branches are broken off. If, if, if the root has to do with salvation, then breaking off a branch that's already grown there would be uh, indicative of a loss of salvation, being removed from a place of salvation. And, and there's no loss of salvation in, in the Scripture. Once you're saved, you're always saved. So it's not talking about salvation. It's being in the pay, place of blessing. And when Israel rejected the Messiah... God removed Israel from being the primary channel of blessing to the world and replaced them with the wild olive branches, which represent the Gentiles. And then there will be a future time when uh, when <coughs> ethnic Jews are, are Israel is added back because then, at, as we know, they will... Uh, uh, be restored to that place of being the primary channel of blessing. So the main idea here is being in that place of blessing that Israel was to, to be in as part of the Abrahamic covenant. God pro- told Abraham that in you, all the world will be blessed. So when we read this passage and we say, Israel has not obtained what it seeks, what was it they were seeking Within the context, and you all ought to be really well trained on this right by now, within the context of Pentateuchal theology, how's that for a big, couple of big words? Within the context of what is in the Mosaic Law. If you're, God says, if you obey me, I will bless you, and all the nations in the world will come to you and wonder what is different about this particular nation. What, it, within the context of the Mosaic Law, you know, don't read the Old Testament back. I mean, the New Testament back into that. That they're seeking salvation, they're seeking heaven, they're seeking blessing within the concept uh, and the construct of the Torah, and, and so Israel has not obtained that temporal or eternal blessing God promised because they have not been obedient. So the the contrast here is between Israel, corporate Israel, the whole on the one hand, that has not obtained what it seeks, which is the blessing, but the elect, that is, those who are the select ones, the remnant, uh, have obtained it. It is through those who are, as Paul says in Romans 9, not all Israel is Israel. It is through them, the true Israel, that God's historic plan of blessing to the world is going to uh, take place. So it's again, it's not talking about them as being selected for justification. It's talking about the fact that those who are the believing remnant of, of Israel are the ones who will be who will realize the blessing ultimately in God's plan of the Abrahamic covenant, and that comes in the future. And then we read read the phrase, <coughs> we read the phrase, uh, and the rest were blinded. Now that's always a fun phrase because it's a passive voice construction. And the the word there refers to being made stubborn or hardened or becoming blind, mostly the concept of hardened. And so people want to look and say, oh, God hardened them. Where does it say that? It just says they became hardened. So we're going to have to talk about that just a little bit. But let's just, I want to give you a graph, a chart first, another set of concentric circles. In Romans 11.7, we're told that Israel has not obtained. Okay, so the blue circle, remember Israel has blue in their flag, so corporate Israel, blue, uh, has not obtained. But there is a remnant, the elect of verse 7, 
that have obtained. Okay, and the rest are blinded. Now, that applies to the uh, pronouns they or their, and uh, which used uh, is used about five times in verses six through ten. Um, they or theirs then used nine times in eleven through fifteen. This is talking about corporate Israel. We have to decide who the they and the their refers to. In um, uh, this is a little bit misleading on this chart. I made this a long time ago. The top section right here. This refers to the 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 the, the corporate group that is out. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, no, it is correct. I misread it. They or the there in the third plural. Uh, of the Greek word autos is used nine times. That's the the uh, third person plural which pronoun, which means they or their, is used in verses eleven to fifteen. Guess what? In verses eleven to fifteen, we talk about this group that is the the they, and it's not talking about the remnant. It's talking about the group that's hardened. We'll see that as we go through. We've got to identify each of those pronouns. So what, what is spoken of here is always a reference back to the group that is, uh, that is hardened. So the elect obtained already. Okay? They already have. We're not talking about them in the rest of the verses. We're talking about the rest that did not obtain. Now when it comes to election, we have basically four options. Let's just think through this logically. A little bit. We don't exegete on the basis of logic, but in terms of understanding things, we we apply logic in order to include and exclude uh, conclusions that wouldn't fit with the passage or with corollary passages. So the question we have to ask is: Does God select this group on the basis of no criteria whatsoever? In other words, is this simply a random, haphazard selection? God just looks down the mass of humanity and says, eeny, meeny, miny, moe, you're elect and you're not, and make a selection like that where there's no criterion whatsoever. It's just purely arbitrary. Does God choose on the... So the question is, does God choose on the basis of no criteria or some? Now, I would ask the question, somebody's going to probably not want to answer this, but I'm saying this rhetorically. Can you find a passage anywhere that says that God elected on the basis of something? The only passage is in 1 Peter 1, 2, elect according to foreknowledge. But what does he foreknow? doesn't tell us. It just says elect according to foreknowledge that his that aspect of his omniscience that knows the knows all events and knows future events and future contingencies that that is related to his choice. It's part of his choice. So yes, we can say no. It's it, the answer to this question is is not that he selects on the basis of no criteria, but obviously he makes a selection on the basis of some criteria. It's not an indiscriminate, arbitrary uh, choice without basis. So it's got to be based on something. Second point, if God chooses on the basis of some criteria, it can either be on the basis of a meritorious criteria, in which case his choice is based on works, that is, merit in the one he's choosing, or it is non-meritorious in the one that's choosing. I left the last part off of that. It's non-meritorious in the part that you. Every now and then I read through my notes and I say, what happened to the rest of that sentence? And I'll tell you what happened. I got a phone call or I got an email and I never completed the sentence that I was writing out and I went on to the next point. I find that now and then. Okay, so it's, it's non-meritorious that, that there's something in the object that's not meritorious. In other words, faith. Faith is non-meritorious. The object of faith is Christ. That's the third point. Faith is non-meritorious. The object of faith has the merit. That's Jesus Christ. If God chose us on the basis of, or God chose us because of faith, 
then that would mean that our faith would be the cause of his selection. That would be meritorious. But if passages like Ephesians 2.89 do not say because of faith, they say through faith, indicating faith is merely a means of appropriating something. It's not the cause. The, the ultimate cause is the love of God. The uh, basis for it is the work of Christ on the cross. So the Bible never really tells us, per se, that God is, that we're elect according to foreknowledge of something. Never defines that. That's what this fourth point addresses. So there's no clear evidence of what that foreknowledge relates to. But absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It doesn't mean that there's nothing there. That takes us back to the first point, that God, uh, just because there's no clear statement, doesn't mean that there's no criterion. There, ha- there is a criterion. God just doesn't clearly tell us what it is. We deduct it. We use deductive logic uh, from comparing Scripture with, with Scripture. So the selection is according to God's own choice as sovereign God. He has the right to choose uh, what people groups he's going to work through and which ones he's not. But he does it in accordance with his foreknowledge. Now, when you look at the history of the Jewish people, you wouldn't you, you look at them, you wouldn't say, well, this is a spiritual elite, spiritually elite group. They are the best of the whole bunch of human beings. You wouldn't say that at all. But God chose them for his purposes based on what he knew. And we're not privy to just all of the factors of his knowledge that went into that. But, the, but it did. Otherwise, you're going to say that God's selection is totally irrational. It's either rational, which means it's based on knowledge, or it's irrational, which, which means it's not. And we don't live in an ir- irrational universe according to the Scripture. So now, we have to understand this issue about they became blind. They became blind. So how do they become hardened? How did they become blind? What's, what's the mechanics for understanding that? So um, <clears throat> we have a couple of options. Let me go back to that verse before we do. Okay. Um, the, the rest were hardened. Okay. So we have two options. Either God is the one who is hardening them. And would, that, would there be a, a, a contextual argument for that? Sure. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. Verse 10, or excuse me, verse 9. Verse 9 is a quote from the Old Testament. Actually, it's, there are three verses Paul weaves together here. God has given them a spirit of stupor. So contextually, there's an argument here to say that God is the one who uh, in some way brings about this blindness. But my, the question we then have to address is, is this a direct or an indirect act of God? Is this, by a direct act, does God just say, okay, I'm going to make you spiritually blind, boom, 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 and the elect over here, I'm going to make spiritually uh, 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 awake. That's how Calvinists would handle this. But that's not how the Bible handles, handles this. What we see is that God does this indirectly through certain laws of obedience and disobedience, which he built into the framework of, uh, of human history and the makeup of man. We can go back to a passage, I've covered this before, in Romans 1.18 and following. In Romans 1.18, we're told that the wrath of God, that's his judgment in time, his judgment in history, his, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. This is not a gnomic statement, as some would take it, that all men suppress truth in unrighteousness, but that his wrath is revealed against those who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And he's going to deal with those kind of groups in the coming, the rest of the chapter and the next chapter. He goes on to say, if you remember, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Even the, the most ardent atheist is knows in his heart of hearts, in the center of his soul, 
that God exists and God will hold him accountable. That's why they get so angry whenever anybody sort of tweaks that. And somewhere deep inside them, all of a sudden, God starts to, to rattle the door of the cellar that they've stuffed him in. And then they get all upset and angry about it. So uh, what Paul says is that everybody knows that God exists. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they're without excuse. Everybody understands it's not verbal revelation. It's not that he's given this to, to them in sentences and propositions. It's a nonverbal revelation, but it's enough to where when you are, look at the heavens and the earth, you know that somebody made it. And, it, and God has, makes that evident within a person, not just outside of him. Because they all, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. See, that's negative volition. They're rejecting God. They're being disobedient to God. And as soon as they're disobedient to God, it sets a course of reactions in motion. As soon as they disobey God, it sets into motion a course of reaction. And the thing that happens is then they become futile or empty in their thinking and their foolish hearts become darkened. See, what's the first thing in the chain of events? It's their negative volition which leads to a darkened heart. What are we talking about over in uh, Romans eleven seven? But the rest are blinded, blinded, having a darkened heart. These are uh, these are uh, related concepts. Being spiritually blinded is meaning that that spiritual light is is removed from your heart. And so what precedes the darkening of the heart is negative volition. And then we see a series of things that take place in Romans, uh, Romans 1, verse uh, <clears throat> 24, 26, and 28. Three stages of descent into depravity. Three stages of descent into depravity. First of all, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts. Then in verse 26, uh, after that, then this, for this reason, God gave them up further to another level of depravity, to vile passions. And then in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. So as a result of the initial negative volition of the human, the result is that we go into a negative volition... And the heart is blinded, not because God intervenes and arbitrarily blinds somebody's mind, but because this is the course of action, is the way God has created things in the universe. So we come to Romans 11.8, and Paul, as I said, weaves together uh, three verses from, uh, three quotes from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy 29, verse 4, Isaiah 29, 10, and Psalms 69, 22. And what he is showing here is that God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day, because that's the result of their negative volition. The, not the remnant, but the non-remnant has hardened themselves against the truth because they've suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. And so as a result of this, God has given them over to the consequences of their negative volition. Deuteronomy 29.4 states, Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. Talking about the fact that because of their spiritual rebellion against God, they have been become, they have become a spiritual spiritually obtuse. Uh, Isaiah twenty nine ten for the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, and he has covered your heads, namely the seers. Notice the blindness has to do with a restriction of revelation. The prophets and the seers, God, God is blinding them by not giving them the truth. I think this is happening in our nation today. I think that we're seeing this again and again because uh, in contrast to a generation ago, 
when we had dozens and dozens and dozens of young men who wanted to serve the Lord and learn how to teach the Bible and go to seminary and did so. Today we, we have uh, many who, who uh, uh, within our camp, Bible teaching churches that don't want to go learn how to teach the Bible. They want to take the lazy way out. They want to take the lazy way out and say, well, can I just do it on the Internet? Why do I have to go to seminary? You can't learn some things on the internet. Now, some, some online education courses are getting better. Uh, Pastor uh, David Roseland's been taking some Hebrew courses, secular Hebrew, through uh, one of the educational organizations in Israel, and he says that their, their pedagogy and the technology is just remarkable. And so uh, some of that kind of thing is available, but it's, it's hard to find that. And, and you can't replace the dynamic of Uh, men in a group learning the language uh, together and encouraging one another uh, in the process as they as they struggle together and learn the language and I think that today we we have fewer and fewer men who want to be uh, want to go in the pastor in fact what's interesting is a lot of men that are in my generation uh, and didn't go into the ministry are now waking up saying you know I should have gone to seminary years ago I want to learn a little bit more about the Bible and maybe do something. But they're in their 50s, 60s, and 70s already. It's a little late. They're not going to have a very lengthy ministry, but but at least they're waking up. But we have a younger generation in their teens, 20s, and 30s to where the pastoral ministry is not a career option for them. And and this is tragic. And I think that I, I see fewer and fewer men. I think this is God removing pastors from who want to teach the Bible from this generation as judgment on the nation, just as he did with Israel. He, um, he closed their eyes to prophets. In other words, he limited the number of prophets that were there to reveal truth to them. And he covered their heads, that is, the seers. Uh, another word, a synonym for prophecy. So that's the parallelism there. Then we get into um, Romans 11.9. And David goes on to say, uh, or Paul goes on to quote from David in uh, Psalm sixty nine twenty two, let their table become a snare before them, and their well being a trap. Verse twenty three, let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see, and make their loins shake, uh, make their loins shake continuously. So uh, in the quote, Paul just quotes from the first part: let their table become a snare and a trap. What this idiom is saying is that they are going to become entrapped and ensnared by their own actions and by their own choices. Uh, The result of their negative volition is going to be spiritual insensitivity, spiritual darkness. They're going to increasingly live uh, within a fantasy world as they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And the result is that they're going to uh, be living in a, in, a, in a world of their own imagination, and the result is going to be instability, unhappiness, and fear. And so this is the picture that we see in Psalm 69.3. They're, they're unstable, they can't see the truth, and the loins shaking continuously as they're governed with anxiety. I don't think we have a nation. Our nation is so drugged now. The number of people who are on all matter of emotional stabilizing drugs is because we have a nation of people who are basically scared to death they're depressed. They don't know how to face life and handle life from the from the uh, context of their own character and their own culture. And so, the only way they can manage to face each and every day uh, is is to uh, have a prescription. And so, this is how they make life work. That's their problem solving device. And so, what we see in verses eight, nine, and ten is a description not of the remnant, but the description of the rest. This is the group that is hardened against the gospel, has hardened, uh, has rejected God's, God's grace in favor of works, as was stated by Paul back in uh, chapter 10, um, verses 2 and 3. Okay, then we get... I've got a quote here from Sandy and Headland's, Headland's commentary in Romans that what we see then is the rejection of Israel is only partial. Yet still there is the great mass of the nation 
on whom God's judgment has come. Okay, so there's one small group that's a remnant, a great mass that has been the recipients of God's judgment. And what of these? Is there no further hope for them? Is this stumbling of theirs such as will lead to a final complete fall? By no means. They're just paraphrasing Paul's argument here. It's only temporary, a working out of the divine purpose. That's what we see in Romans 11, uh, starting in verse 11. Now, in this section, I've sort of put in some of the Greek words, transliterated them, so we can see some of the, the flow of the argument here. Because if you notice in the, in the New King James Version, in verse 11, Paul says, I say then, have they stumbled... Um, verse 11, have they stumbled that they should fall? But the word for fall is the word pipto. In the next sentence, it says in the English, certainly not, but through their fall, but it's not pipto. It's paraptoma, which means their transgression. So it should be translated, I say then, have, have they stumbled with the result that they have fallen irretrievably? irrecoverably. Certainly not, but through their transgression. What's the transgression? The transgression was the rejection of the Messiah. Through their transgression, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, this isn't talking about justification, individual salvation. How do we know that? Because not every Gentile is saved. What we're talking about is the opening up of God's plan to the Gentiles, the whole plan of salvation, not phase one, but the whole plan of salvation. And this is what we've seen that we've studied in Acts, that Paul was selected to be the apostle to the Gentiles, which we're going to see in a couple of verses. He's selected to be the apostle to the Gentiles and to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And the church is going to include both Jew and Gentile on an equal status, equal footing within the body of Christ. So as we look at this, at this particular passage here, we see that, that uh, the focus is, continues to be on corporate Israel and the Gentiles. In the first ten verses, just to run all this together for you, uh, what we saw was that while Israel as a nation, as a corporate entity, failed to attain righteousness... Uh, this rejection of the Messiahship of Jesus was not a total rejection. There were Jewish people, many Jewish people, thousands and thousands, who did accept Jesus as Messiah. And down through the generations, there have been thousands who have. In fact, during the uh, period called the, uh, 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 of, of the uh, Enlightenment in, this, in the 18th century, there was a, a vast host of, uh, in fact, it, it's almost like it is today. Today, there's a, a, a just an inordinate amount of assimilation among the Jews in the United States. Just an incredible number of uh, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 60% of Jewish marriages today are outside of the faith. And just uh, 50 years ago, it was less than 17%. That's a huge shift. But what we're seeing today was very similar to what was going on in, in the um, in the late uh, late 1700s. In fact, uh, the the Jewish community in, in Berlin was just devastated because of the large number of Jews that were just assimilating into the culture and assim and becoming Christians. Uh, one of the um, one of the most well-known uh, Jews of that era in the 17th century was Moses Mendelssohn. Uh, his son, Felix Mendelssohn, was a well-known composer uh, and musician. He converted to Christianity, as did every one of Moses Mendelssohn's son, uh, children. They all converted to Christianity. Moses Mendelssohn is considered the father of Reformed Judaism. Uh, which was a liberal form that rejected orthodoxy, rejected uh, basically all of the tenets of Judaism in favor of, a, of one that was consistent with the new Enlightenment thinking uh, in, in Europe. But almost all of his children, I think all of his children, converted to Christianity. And this, this was like a, a, a huge shift that occurred in the Jewish community in Europe during uh, the, late, the late 1700s. So there have been thousands and thousands of Jews who have 
uh, become Christians who have recognized that Jesus, Jesus is the Messiah. But they're the remnant. The vast majority have not. They're the ones that are hardened. So when Paul says, I say then, look at verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled? To whom does the preposition they refer? That's the key question. The they doesn't refer to the remnant because they didn't stumble. The they refers to the remainder of the Jews, the the corporate uh, group of Jews that had rejected the Messiahship of Jesus. And so when we read through this section, starting in verse 11, we have to remember that what Paul's talking about at this point is God's plan, what's going to happen to this entity that has, because of their negative volition, has been removed from being the primary source of blessing to the world. We're not talking about getting to heaven here. We're talking about their role within God's plan as the, as, as the means of blessing uh, to the world. So Paul says, have they stumbled that they, uh, that they should fall? And the way he uh, sets up this question indicates a negative answer. It's a rhetorical question, and the negative answer would, uh, would, that you expect is no, certainly not, not at all. He is extremely adamant about uh, his answer. So we have, a, um, have the question asked implying a negative answer, which he gives, and the significance of the grammar uh, between the verbs for stumbling and falling indicates that uh, that the, the, that there introduces what's the Greek word zahina, which is a final purpose clause, which indicates have they stumbled with a result that they should have fallen, and the implication is permanently. I think the... Um, uh, the NIV, I'd written this down in my notes and I can't find it. The NIV translates it something like that, uh, that have they, oh, here, here I have it. Have they fallen beyond recovery? That's the NIV. Uh, did Israel stumble? That is, did this, this non-remnant portion stumble that they might fall irretrievably or completely or beyond recovery? And Paul's answer is vehemently no, not at all. Uh, the reason, uh, the cause of the fall is then given in the next phrase, through, that is by means of, it's an instrumental dative again, uh, but by means of their transgression uh, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has now come to the Gentiles. Now, so Paul's question is, is the hardened, uh, the, the, did the hardened of Israel stumble only to fall irretrievably? No, it's not beyond recovery. I um, added something to this slide, and that is to clarify all of the pronouns. Have they, that is, has hardened Israel stumbled that they, the hardened of Israel, should, should fall permanently? Certainly not, but through their, that is, uh, hardened of Israel, through their transgression, to provoke them, the hardened of Israel, to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So God has a plan. You're going to reject my plan for you, the plan to put you in a place of blessing to all the world? Well, I'm going to do an end run. I'm going to bring the Gentiles, whom you've despised, I'm going to bring them in, and they will become the path of blessing. And this is going to ultimately make you so jealous that you will ultimately return back to me, but it's not going to be without a lot of difficulty. Romans eleven twelve then states, Now if their fall, that is the hardened of Israel, if their fall is riches for the world, because they're taken out of the place of blessing, now that rich blessing of God is for, flows to the whole world. So if their, if their fall... Their transgression is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles. Notice corporately how much more their fullness. Now, one of the reasons we know that this isn't talking about individual salvation is not every Gentile is saved, neither is every Jew uh, hardened. Okay, so we're talking about God's corporate plan for each of these groups in relation to his blessing. 
not salvation. So fullness here can have the meaning of of fullness, the meaning of wholeness, or the meaning of completeness in contrast to something partial. That's the situation we've got with Israel right now is that it is it is uh, that there, there is a corporate removal from the place of blessing. So there needs to be a corporate restoration and completion. So that's the idea there. How much more when they are fully restored to that place of blessing? And then in verse 13 and verse 14, we're going to see that this is a parenthesis. And it's really important to understand that. In fact, the failure to note that on the part of commentators and exegetes has led to some really odd, odd conclusions. But Romans, uh, Romans 13 is an introductory explanation. It begins with the English word for, which is a common e- explanation as it is in this place for the uh, Greek word gar, which introduces an explanation. He's explaining verse 12. So 13 and 14 are a parenthesis between the statement of verse 12 and the continuation of the statement in verse 15. If you want to read the flow of Paul's argument, you just go from 12 to 15. 13 and 14 are a parenthetical statement where Paul states, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, that's our key, one of our key passages, that Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. He says, uh, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. So the fact that he's an uh, apostle to the Gentiles doesn't mean God said, don't ever witness to the Jews. Just like he didn't say to Peter, don't ever talk to the Gentiles. Remember, it was Peter who went to Cornelius, the Gentile. Uh, Peter's primary ministry was to Jews, but that doesn't mean he never gave the gospel to Gentiles. The same thing was true for Paul. Now, here's where I've put, we'll see that something similar again later on, just to introduce this to you right now. 11, 12 states, now if there, that is the hardened of Israel, if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure, riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For if, they're, if the, that the hardened of Israel being cast away is the reconciling of the world. See, the idea here of the reconciliation of the world explains the idea of riches to the world. The, the, the gospel going out to the Gentiles. For if they're being cast away is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead so if if removing them from being the primary channel of blessing to the world brings an increase of blessing to the whole world how much more blessing there'll be to the whole world when they're brought back into the fold and they become a primary channel of blessing again then the blessing will be, be multiplied even more to the whole world so that's his main idea is that for God's full plan of blessing to the world to be fulfilled, then Israel needs to be uh, fully uh, restored to that place of blessing. So verse 15 starts off. Now, I've got some arrows in here, and that's going to point to some different things. For if they're being cast away, Agar, this, this is a if, and it's true, so the gar is for the explanation for if, and it's true that they're being cast away, led to the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be? And in this slide, what I've done is, because I didn't have them all on the same slide, is saying that there takes us back to the previous verse. And that is the saving some of them in verse 14. So the uh, their acceptance... Uh, this, those who are ultimately uh, realize full salvation when the remnant becomes the whole, the fullness of Israel, then um, uh, then that will bring, bring greater blessing to all. Now here in this slide, I've put the four verses together. It's a little maybe hard for some of you to read all of that, but it's important to get the structure down here. 13 and 14 are grouped together in the middle because that's the parenthetical thought. Their failure is related to their being cast away. Verse 15 picks up the main idea 
of verse 12. That's all I'm showing in that slide is that the there of verse 15 goes back to the there of verse 12. Corporate is God's plan for corporate Israel. So, let's go back to this slide. Now, if their failure is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more uh, their fullness? Okay. Let's just skip on to 13. I want to skip that, that one slide. Sometimes when these things come over from another program, they don't convert well. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I may magnify my ministry. Let me just skip all over here. Okay, verse 16. Now we get into the illustration. I think I have time to cover this. Take a couple extra minutes. Verse 16. Now we get another explanation here, or, or actually this is an ongoing thought. It's not an explanation, even though you have the English word for there. It translates the Greek word de, which indicates that he's breaking his thought to bring in an illustration. It's not an explanation. He's saying, now, uh, now if they're being cast away, or, or now if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy, and the root is holy, so are the branches. Now, this is, descri- this is the, the, what's being described here is the first fruit offering that's described in Numbers 15, 19 through 20. Then it shall be that when you eat of the fruit of the land, you shall lift up an offering to the Lord of the first of your dough. Okay, the first is the word aparko, that's the, the first part of your dough, that's the second word, pharamatos, and that's the phrase in the, in the Septuagint of, of uh, Numbers 15, 19 through 20. That's the exact same phrase that Paul uses at the beginning of verse 16, the first fruits. It's that same phrase. It's the first of the lump. So he's talking about the first fruits. Now, the first fruit is holy. What does that word holy mean? Does that mean it's pure and it's righteous? No. It means it's set apart. That's the key to understanding this. We're not talking about making Israel holy in a purified, righteous, salvation sense. But it's talking about if the first fruit is set apart to God, then the lump is also. So you have the whole lump of dough. You bread bakers know what I'm talking about. You have that whole lump of dough. And if you take out just part of it, that's the first fruit, but that is holy and it has already set apart and sanctified the whole. The lump is holy. And then he changes the metaphor to a plant. He changes the metaphor to a a plant in the second half of verse 16. And he says, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now, what he's pointing out here is that the the lump and the uh, the, the whole lump represents the the um, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The branches of the the natural branches on the olive tree also represent the physical ethnic descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, the the part that is separated is uh, in the lump, is related to the remnant, which also, we're told, sanctifies something larger. It sanctifies the whole, not in the sense of personal righteousness or holiness, but in the sense of it's still set apart for the purpose of God. In the whole imagery of the first fruit, the first fruit was set aside to God And by that action, the entire harvest would be said to be set apart to God. In the same way with the tree imagery, the root is set apart to God. And by the branches' participation in the root, they are said to be set apart to God. Now, this is important because in the parallelism of the imagery of the lump and the imagery of the olive tree, we see that what, what the only thing that Paul could be talking about is that the, the root and the, the uh, first fruit is the Abrahamic covenant. And it's the Abrahamic covenant 
that establishes God's plan for blessing through Israel. The, the patriarchs and their descendants were set apart to God as a chosen nation, and that it was through them that the blessings of God, uh, especially in salvation, would be challenged, channeled to all mankind. And so what happens in divine judgment because of Israel's negative volition, if some of the branches, the natural branches, the natural ethnic descendants of Israel are broken off, that is, they're removed from that special place of being a blessing to the world, if they're removed and you, Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them become a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. So the Gentiles are wild, the wild olive branches that are grafted in so that now we are a channel of blessing to the world. But that's a temporary state. We shouldn't get arrogant about it. This is verse 18. Do not boast against the branches, the natural branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, that is the Abrahamic covenant, with Israel, but the root supports you. This is why we still honor uh, Israel, still honor the Jewish people. Even though we disagree on uh, critical theological issues, we still support them because they are the natural branches and related to the root, which is the Abrahamic covenant. So in Romans 11.19, Paul says, You'll say then, branches were broken off that I can be grafted in. I must be special. God removed those branches so I could be grafted in. That's the, that's the thinking of anti-Semitism. But, Paul says, well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off. But you stand by faith. It's non-meritorious. It's not because you're so special. So don't be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. So if you're a Gentile, don't think you're so special. Because if God were willing to remove ethnic Israel from being the channel of blessing, what's to keep him from removing Gentiles? And then he goes on from there. I just wanted to get through that illustration so we have it. We'll come back next time, review it a little more, because it really sets the stage for what eventually transpires in Paul's argument, and the key verses are going to be verses 25 leading up to verse 26 where Paul announces that in this manner all Israel uh, will be saved. So we'll come back and complete that probably next time. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things this evening, to be reminded of your grace, your goodness, your gracious choice of Abraham and his descendants to be the custodians of your word and through whom the Messiah would come. And, Father, we recognize that that we're... Uh, inherently no better and no worse than any other people, any Jews, anyone else, but that we are all saved the same way by your grace through faith, and the object of faith is the Messiah who has come, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins, and through him we have eternal life. Father, we thank you for uh, helping us to understand these things this evening. We pray that as we reflect upon it, our strength of our convictions of the truth of your word, Uh, will be enhanced, and we'll also have a great appreciation for your plan and purposes for for Israel and for their future. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.